chicken sandwich and coffee. This is my chicken sandwich and coffee. I want these things off the ship. I don't care if it takes every man we've got. I want them off the ship. Hi, I'm Justin Baird. I'm president of Blueprint 1543. I'm a psychological scientist and former university professor. And in this episode, I want to follow up on what I've been talking about in terms of tech prudence. What should our stance be? How eager should we be to welcome new technologies into our lives, into our societies? In a previous episode, I talked about how there essentially no tech is inevitable. Rather, we should appropriately put up fights when we think that technology is going to go south for us, that is going to lead to problems that we don't want to see in our lives, our children's lives, our society's lives. But to do that, we need to figure out which is the tech that we should really be hesitant about uh, versus enthusiastic. When should we curb our tech enthusiasm? So what I want to do is not just talk about, okay, I'm going to be afraid of every tech because some of it might go badly. Rather, think of it this way, different approach. The sciences are really good at studying both the consequences and sometimes unintended consequences of various forms of technology. And by technology here, I mean broadly human-made stuff that's designed to solve some kind of a problem, even if that problem is just entertainment or eating or clothing or whatever it is. So we often use the word tech and we think high tech, but there's low tech too. And it's still a technology and all kinds of programs as well as artifacts are technology. So even something as simple as a lip balm is a technology. Humans made it to solve a particular problem, dry lips. Water bottles are a technology. So there are lots of technologies out there. And I do want to be very broad with this. So if we think about some technologies like, say, uh, medicines, we know that these have to be tested and retested and retested before they get government approval. Likewise, with many food products and other sorts of regulated technologies. But there are many technologies that don't have that kind of oversight that they get produced by certain companies and then they get released on us and market dynamics get to determine whether they're going to be used or not. And a lot of our digital and other high-tech things fall into these categories. They're not carefully studied. They could be, but they're not. And there's a really simple reason. They would be astronomically expensive if we had to experimentally and rigorously test out the consequences and unintended consequences of introducing each and every new technology into society. Money, money, money. You know, somebody invents a new shovel and now we have to run double blind experimental studies on using the shovel and how that changes society. It's too slow. It's impractical. So we often don't do that kind of testing before releasing new technologies into society. And we just, in some ways, are hoping that they don't have unintended negative consequences that we didn't anticipate. And most don't, probably. It sure doesn't seem like most of them are, but some will. So it seems to me the real problem is which ones are going to spread really rapidly such that if a problem arises, it is widespread and it's got deep roots such that it's really hard to extract from our lives if it turns out to be problematic. My chicken sandwich and coffee. This is my chicken sandwich and coffee. I want these things off the ship. I don't care if it takes every man away we've got. I want them off the ship. My Riddell lectures on curbing your tech enthusiasm, which you can find online, I have made the comparison to an invasive plant. Feed me Simo. Feed me all night long. For instance, kudzu in the United States is a very common example. So which technology is going to be like kudzu? What I mean by that is so... For those who don't know, kudzu is a plant that is native to uh, Far East Asia, not North America, but it was brought to the Americas, it seems, first as an ornamental plant because people thought it kind of looked cool, and then it was spread pretty widely as a relatively inexpensive feed crop for livestock because cattle and goats and things like that can eat kudzu and it grows really aggressively. Under some conditions, it's been reported it grows as much as like a meter a day or three or four feet a day on the sort of outside, but a foot a day, not a problem for kudzu. 
It was used to address erosion problems, especially in the southeast of the United States. So people are building roads, cutting into mountainsides, and now you've got bare mountainside that doesn't have any plant matter on it. And so you've got a, an erosion problem. That's going to turn into a landslide and move down the hill. Kudzu. It'll hold that hillside together. It's a technology then to solve an ecological problem. It turns out it was too good at spreading. And now it's everywhere. It's knocking down power lines, bridges, roads, barns, houses. It's sometimes referred to as the, the vine that ate the South because it grows so aggressively. And it's really hard to eradicate now. It's grown widely and deeply. It's hard to extract from our lives now. And so it's destroying not just those kinds of structural things, but is creating other kinds of ecological damage. So an ecological solution ends up becoming an ecological problem. What I'm concerned about then is new technologies that are like kudzu because they spread too broadly and too deeply to be able to extract once we figure out that they're problematic. Those are the technologies I think we really ought to keep an eye on. Okay, so it'd be great then if we have some way of identifying what those technologies are going to be. And it's tempting to just say, well, it's going to be those that get enough advertising money behind them. Well, that's that's certainly part of part of it, but that's not going to be all of it. You can advertise some things till you're blue in the face and not everybody is going to uptake them. And they're not necessarily going to be deeply entrenched in your lives. Right. We see all kinds of drugs that have huge advertising budgets, but it doesn't mean that we are all using those drugs and that we can't stop using them. All right. We can all just go, no, I'm not taking them anymore. And we're done. I think what we need to look at is sort of deeper factors like what are the products that somehow tickle our brains, the way our minds and brains naturally work, or our social relationships naturally work, such that they kind of needle in there, push the right buttons so that we are very attracted to them. And in some ways, we can't help but be attracted to them because they're playing off of our natural cognitive and psychological system. So I think that's where we need to focus. There are a few heuristic kinds of questions that then I like to ask about these technologies to identify, are they that type of thing? I'm going to go into greater detail on what are those questions that we can ask about new technologies and how do they help us identify problematic tech? I'm going to list them real quickly now so that you know where I'm headed, but they're going to take a little bit of time to unpack. In brief, they are going to be, how easy is it to use? because it's taking advantage of just the way our minds naturally work. Some ideas are easier to think than others by nature of us being human beings. Does the technology take advantage of that ease so that they're easy to use? They're easy to think about. They're easy to learn how to use and so forth. So easy. Second, are we naturally motivated to use the kind of product? Hey, John, you're lucky I didn't invest in that ridiculous automobile idea. Yeah, that's going to make a lot of money. We're not naturally motivated to use shovels because shovels don't sort of do naturally motivating stuff for us. But do they naturally motivate us because they're sort of, uh, there's a basic human drive that this new technology is trying to address. I don't know where the break is. What? Third, are they attention grabbing in a particular way? not only easy to use, but there's something about it that makes it, ooh, that's kind of cool too, or kind of special, or really makes me pay attention to it. Okay. I'm motivated. It's easy. Attention grabbing. And, or does it finally piggyback on other well-established technologies that we're already very fluent with using, we're very comfortable with, and those technologies are hard to eradicate. And so this piggybacks on that. Those are going to be my four basic questions. Is it easy? Are we motivated? Is it attention grabbing? Or does it piggyback on something that has those other features? And I'll explain those more in the next video in this series where I'm starting to talk about tech prudence. So thanks for joining me. Hang with me. Look for the next one to drop. As always, like, subscribe, share, list comments, and see you next time as we continue to talk about tech prudence.